Welcome, Mark, and welcome to Greece. <laughs> and by the way, Michael's got some very cool stickers. <laughs> there will be stickers afterwards. Um, you can come up and get them or find me outside. And um, We are well known for our stickers at Honeycomb. So, um, it's um, pronounced Thwaites, by the way. Everybody gets it wrong. It's absolutely fine. That's why I go by uh, Martin.net everywhere, because um, it's a lot easier to spell on Twitter. Um, so, um, this is a... A bit of a passion talk for me. Um, this is a, um, a project that I spent two years building um, with a couple of uh, friends of mine. Um, and we kind of found a way of building software that I don't think a lot of people do. And it's nothing new. There's lots of different concepts in here that are already existing. There's nothing really new in terms of concepts. It's just a different way of implementing those concepts, but it builds things in a way that I call operable. Um, and we'll go through what I think that means. But it does build on principles like TDD and BDD and things like that, um, and kind of the, the core principles of why those exist. Um, but it is, to me, it's a passion project. It's the reason why I, I do this talk um, in a lot of places. Um, so, yeah. Um, who am I? I am uh, Martin Thwaites. I am first and foremost an observability evangelist. I am somebody who has been going around talking about how we understand our production systems and things like that for many, many years. Um, I'm also a developer advocate at a company called Honeycomb. You can find me on Twitter at martin.net or on Mastodon at martin.net at ollie.social. Um, so what are we going to do today? So we're going to go through a few bits. Um, first of all, we're going to go through what is operable software, or more specifically, what is it I term operable so software as. Um, we're going to go through a little bit about how we test software as an, an engineers. And we're going to go through what is called outside-in testing, which is a lot of the basis of what we built um, at the bank. Um, and then we'll go through a little bit about how observability fits into outside-in testing and building software that's built for production. So what is it I consider to be operable software? So first and foremost, it is software that's built to run in production. Because nobody cares about your local machine. If you write software and it doesn't go into production and users don't use it, did you actually write any software? I don't know. Um, so it's software that is built to run in production. It's built with the people who are going to run it in mind when you actually write it. You're not writing it for those features, you're writing it for the production systems, you're writing it for those production environments, and those are supported by people. That might be you, it might be somebody else in your team, it might be a different team entirely, but writing software that's built to make sure that those people understand how it works and can debug it and all of those kind of things. It's also built for things like fast recoverability because it knows that it's in a production environment. You're building it, with, building it with resiliency in mind. And all that really brings it round to this idea that we need to, in our software, emit robust telemetry signals. Now, you notice there that I've not said, we need to put in logs. We need to put loads of metrics out. We need to put loads of tracing out. That's really not what this is about. This is about the idea of how do we emit signals that allow us to understand our software systems. And I found when we were um, running this project, a lot of people don't really think about how, we, um, how the software works beyond their local machine. So we built something that is very, very different to that. Now, when we talk about operable software, what is it we mean by software? Well, it's absolutely everything that gets your software from your local machine all the way through into a production system and production systems that people are using it. So that's everything from your application, CI/CD pipelines, any of your unit tests, integration tests, acceptance tests, any tests that you run whatsoever. It's also about things like your observability tooling. All of that is software. It is the software that helps your customers use your um, product. So all of it needs to be considered when we build software. It's not just that method that you write in the code. It's way more than that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about testing. Let's talk about what it is that we do when we say TDD. TDD is one of the most co-opted terms 
and cargo culted things that I've ever seen. Because people have taken the ideas behind TDD and wrote frameworks behind it. They've talked about how to do it in a very, very constrained context. But TDD is not about the specific things that a lot of people do today. So what do we mean? Well, TDD is about contract first. It's about defining the contract in which we are going to interact with the thing. That might be a class, it might be a HTTP API, it might be a message, but we define that contract first. We talk about things like red, green, refactor, and how we will write code, we'll break code, and then we'll refactor that code, and we'll make sure that all the tests keep passing. But it all comes really down to the fact that we write the tests before we write the implementation. That's what TDD is about. Now, you notice I've not talked there about mock or stubs or classes or methods or verifying because none of that is what TDD is about. Those are the core elements of what TDD is. But it's commonly misunderstood as let's mock all the things. We've all had that class that has 17 dependencies inside the constructor and we have a mock for every single one of those classes and our test methods are massive. Um, the astute among you of the .NET developers will notice I called it MOQ because that's what everybody uses. Um, but there's also this idea of I write one method and I test one method and I test one method and I make sure that one method calls this other method and that's my test. But that isn't what TDD is. When people say I do TDD and then they go, why well, put all these mocks in my software? Well, that's not really what TDD is. TDD is a workflow. It's a way of thinking about how you test. It's not the way you test. So why do we do TDD then? What's the reason why TDD exists? So it helps us with designing our contracts. And what I mean by that is because we're writing tests against our contract, we're a user of that contract. Now, if we can't understand how that contract works, then our customers, our users, cannot understand that contract. Therefore, the contract is wrong. So by using a TDD methodology and saying, this is what I want to do, not this is how I'm building the thing, and then I'm going to write a test that works with what I built. We write the test first. We're defining how it's supposed to work. Now, it also helps us with understanding the code base, because what we're doing is we're writing the interface first. We're defining the behaviors. This is one of my favorites around TDD, is because your tests become your documentation. And I'm sure everybody here loves writing documentation, yeah? Yeah? Well, just write tests. Then you don't need to write documentation. It's great. <laughs> um, OK. So, but what's the bad? What, what's the, the bad things about documentation? Uh, bad things about TDD? So, normally when we write tests in a TDD way, we're doing it without thinking about the consumers. And when I talk about consumers, I'm talking about the external users of our system, because they're the people we care about. So we write tests that are not really about what the system behavior is supposed to be. We write tests to validate an implementation. But the other thing is, and this is one of the big things that we got when we were bringing new people onto the team, was that people were like, well, I don't, if I write all these tests in a TDD way, it becomes really brittle and it's hard to do and I have to write more tests. And I think that's a, an issue that when we cargo cult the ideas behind PD, TDD, that yes, they do end up being brittle. You end up with 4,000 unit tests on a single class. Everybody's got that class in their code base. I see some nods, yes, you all know which one it is. Nobody cares about those 4,000 tests. Nobody, other than you. Nobody cares. The customers don't care that you've got 4,000 tests on a single class. The customers care that the system works. 
Okay. So let's talk a little bit about component testing. Everybody's seen the meme? Um, and this is what we find quite a lot in .NET world, um, is the idea that we'll write tons of unit tests. You'll have that class with the 4,000 unit tests in it, and you'll go, great, ship it. It's got tons of tests. We've got all of these tests on all of these classes. Every class has some tests on it. Let's just ship it. And then it doesn't work. And it doesn't work because we've not tested those things together. Now, there's, I hate the term integration testing because it can mean so many different things to so many different people. Component testing is the same thing. So I'm going to try and dig deeper into exactly what I mean by this. Now, if you take nothing away for, else away from today, is that names are trash. Don't take away a name and do the thing. Understand why. Understand the benefits and why you're doing the thing. So... There's a term called outside in testing. It's not as well widely known. And that to me is what component testing is. We're testing components in our, inside of our system from the outside, not from the inside. Unit testing, in the way that a lot of people do it, is about testing classes. We're testing the inside. But our customers use the outside. And that's the thing that's important. So outside in testing, in your, I mean, I would imagine probably 90% of the room is writing web servers, uh, web APIs and websites. So we've got HTTP APIs as our primary mechanism that our customers are going to be using. So this is about testing from the outside. It's about testing how we get inputs and outputs from the system. That might be a HTTP post. It might be a get. It might be a send a message into the system, but the inputs and outputs to our services. That's what we should be testing. But what's really interesting about this is that we're testing from a user perspective. We're testing from what a actual consumer of our microservice, our website, would actually be doing. Yes, they will hit that class that you've got with 4,000 tests that you're really proud of. But they don't hit it directly. Now, if you're writing DLLs, if you're writing packages, then the thing that you're talking about is actually an API method. But what we're saying here is go as far out towards your consumer as you can get. Now, what's really interesting about this then is that we're actually testing the business requirements. We're testing what a user wants our system to do, our package, our API, our website, we're testing what they want us to do, which is way more important than that one individual class that you've got. So what are the benefits? Well, we're, we're talking about business requirements. You know that, that BA that you've got that comes over and says, here's all the things that our system needs to do. Well, you write all the tests that prove that it does that system. So actually, you've tested all the business requirements. What's really great about this is it really pushes on the BAs that they need to think about what the business requirements actually are. Now, fun story, we, um, we had some BAs and product owners in the um, company, and I love to be a pedant. So when they came up and went, um, so the, there's no API for balance. And the, the balance doesn't go up and down when transactions come into the system. Because we wrote a bank from scratch doing this methodology. And they came up, well, the balance doesn't change on the user's account. You didn't give me a requirement for that. So I need to take a transaction and tell me that I need to update the balance on that API. And what that means is that Ultimately, these POs and BAs get really involved in this process about really thinking about what the user should actually see. When I call the balance endpoint, it should show the balance of all of the transactions. Which means that you actually get more confidence in the system. Now, it does mean that you need to work with them a lot more. But that means that you've actually got a better relationship with those product owners. 
Now, when we're running outside in tests, because we're testing things from a user perspective, we can actually write tests that are really, really readable. Things that make sense in English context or Greek context. You can write things that use domain language, not technical language. Well, the other thing is we're testing our application completely. We're testing everything in our application every single time we run a test. As opposed to those 4,000 tests that run that one class. We're testing everything all of the time. My, one of my favorites, I don't have to write another mock in my life, which is great. No stubs, no mocks, because we're using the actual system all the time. Everybody's got co-coverage metrics in their system. Everybody hit 100%, yeah? Because 100% means you're fully tested and then you can just go ship it, yeah? It's a vanity metric, I hate it. But if you run things this way, you end up with 100% code coverage because one of two things is happening. If there is a line of code that isn't covered, one of two things has happened. Either that code is redundant and you can delete it, or you're missing a test. You're missing something that a user would do to your system that would trigger that bit of code. So you can actually hit 100% code coverage. You can just delete code. It's great. Deleting code is the best. And we, we actually, so Honeycomb really known for stickers. We have a sticker called the sticker that says the only diff, the only good diff is a red diff. So, I touched a little bit on readable tests, and I think this is one of my biggest benefits around writing tests like this. So, what what do I mean by readable tests? Test names that are descriptive. Might sound obvious, but your compiler does not care how long your method names are. Really doesn't. So you can write really descriptive names. You don't need to stick with acronyms and abbreviations and make your test methods really short. You can write something really descriptive. Yes, you can use descriptions and things like that. But what's much better about using the actual method names is you can navigate to them a lot better. But we also build things like reusable actions. Things that you do repetitively in tests, you can wrap them in context so they make sense when you read it. You can give them a little bit of a create something using the API because I want to test something else using the API. We can abstract away different bits of implementation because they're not relevant to the test. Now, all of these, I'm going to go through some examples. We are going to use .NET. I'm sorry for the Java people in the room. Um, these will all work with Java. I'm just a .NET guy, so um, all of this is in .NET. It works in Java. It works in JavaScript. It works in um, .NET as well. And there's some links at the end, um, presentations of um, a couple of people, one of them doing it in JavaScript. But yeah, what, what I'm meaning here is we're talking about what the customer understands. We're not talking about the iTransaction service inside of our application. We're not talking about the iDiscount service. And we're writing tests for our iDiscount service. What we're actually doing is we're writing tests that test that a transaction can be created. An authorization can happen. A clearing can happen. Which means that we're talking about things that people like the POs understand. Another fun fact, when we started showing these tests to the POs, they said, would you mind if we showed these to the exec team? It's like, you want to show code to the exec team? It's like, yeah, because they make sense. Because the tests that we were writing actually made English sense. They were a story that they could understand. Now, the other thing that I like to say is that we should be writing more tests, not more asserts. Um, everybody's got that particular test with 400 asserts in it, yeah? Big, big long list. What's really bad about that is it normally blocks at the first assert, depending on your framework. So the first assert fails, all the rest fail. Which, yes, it means you only get one test failure, um, which makes you look good, because only, oh, only one test failed, but then it failed 15 times, because then you fixed that one, and then had to fix the next one, and then had to fix the next one, and then the next one, and the next one. 
If you write tests in a readable way, if you write them with reusable actions, you can actually write lots and lots of tests that test individual things and give you isolation really, really quickly. So why wouldn't we? So this is the, the question I got on the first time that I um, did this presentation. So I had a chat with a few people. And yes, this is BDD. But guess what? TDD was about BDD. TDD was about behavior, not implementation. What we're doing is we're defining the behavior that we want. And we're testing to make sure that behavior happens. But we're not testing the implementation under the hood. I'm not talking about given when thens. I will never recommend anybody use Cucumber, ever. But what we're writing is tests that are out about behavior. So yes, technically, BDD. But no, don't use Cucumber. And I won't give anybody stickers if you're using Cucumber, just to be clear. So let's have a little look at some code. So this is a basic method in .NET. We're using something called a web application factory, which spins up our stuff in memory. Um, we create a web application factory. We get a client for that. Um, and then we post something to the API, which is our to-do item. Um, and then we check to make sure it's a 200 OK response. Now, the easiest way to make this test pass is just make every single API return 200, which is a completely valid way to do development. So how do we make this test better? And yes, I get this as a contrived example. Take away from this, I've done this at scale, writing a bank with very, very few unit tests and tens of thousands of these. It works. So let's remove the implementation. Now those two lines at the top that we saw, they're irrelevant to this test. What we need is an API. Let's just move those out, stick them in the constructor, stick them in the startup. We don't need them. Let's make it AAA. Everybody heard of AAA? Arrange, act, assert. Three different sections of your test. Well, we're arranging because we've got our to-do item. We're acting because we want to post that to-do item. And then we're asserting at the end. And then let's add some context. This is called evident testing. Because all of them items in that to-do thing, they're not relevant to this test. What we care about, if you look at the name of this test, which is add a to-do item with a valid request, returns OK. The fact that it has a name of something, it has a description of something, isn't actually relevant to the test. It's just noise. So get a valid to-do item and post a valid to-do item. So now we've got something that, from a BA's perspective, somebody who doesn't write code, they understand what that's doing. It's a valid to-do item, and I'm posting it to the to-do endpoint. You could go further, you could add specific methods to your client, all of those things you can do. It's up to you, really, how far you go. But work with the BAs to understand what makes sense to them. Now, I talked about adding specific asserts. Well, if we add a, um, another method, I said the, the last one we could just do with making everything return 200. Well, let's make it harder. Well, it now needs to return a valid ID. So I've used the same two lines that we had before and just added a new test with a different assert on it. I'd leave the first test there. It's a really good test to tell us whether the API is even working at all during our test failure. And this is where it gets really interesting, when we get to things like persistent. Because the last one, I could just generate a random number in my response, and it would still pass. But a customer isn't going to do that. A customer is going to want to add a to-do item to our system, and then they're going to want to get that to-do item back using that ID. Now, what we do here is we have a method there that says create valid to-do item. Now, what that's going to do is it's going to go to our to-do item API, and it's going to post a valid to-do item to that API and get an ID back. It's not going to reach into the database and try and push stuff into the database, because if you're letting your users push stuff into your database directly, 
I'd need to have a chat about your application design because I don't think that's the right one. So testing this the way that a user would do it is more important. So we're posting a to-do item, we're gonna go and get the to-do item, and we're making sure the one that we get back has the same ID. Again, you could go as far as you want with these sort of things. But the idea is I've not done anything about mocking a class here. Yes, this would have a database, and there's an example, this is all code that's on GitHub. It uses Entity Framework and uses SQLite as a database. So it is all persistence. It's all working. So let's quick recap. What exactly have we tested? So one of the things we've tested is the startup of our application. We've tested to make sure that our dependency injection has been set up. So for the .NET developers in the room, how many people have created a new service class, tested it, works 100%, 4,000 unit tests, and forgot to add it to their dependency injection in container before they deployed it? A room full of liars. But that's a common thing to do because we've wrote the tests and we've made sure our class works. But what we've not done is we've not tested that application holistically. By doing this, we're testing it holistically every single time. We've also tested things like routing. So that route for slash to do item and a post to that, we've made sure that those are set up properly and they work. We've tested things like serialization and deserialization. We've made sure that the casing is right when things come in. One of the key things that I say when you're using this kind of methodology is never reuse in your tests the contracts from your code. Because if you use the same classes, when you refactor, you refactor both at the same time. Now what's really key about this, and you've probably seen some talks on pack testing and contract testing, is that this is actually helping with contract testing. Because if all your classes are based outside of there, that's your contract test. Because if those change and your tests break, all of your consumers are gonna break. And you can think, put things like, we have a, um, a git path rule that says if this particular path is changed, then somebody else needs to review it, which means that you get that extra check. We've tested things like model validation. The things that happen in an AOP style that happen outside of your code. We've tested all of those. We've tested database interaction. We've tested constraints and selecting. We've tested more specifically the, business, the customer APIs, the customers that are doing it. But the key is we've tested the business requirements. We've not tested the code that we've built. Now, fun fact, there was a team in the bank that built an entire system using this. It was called our tenant management system, because it's a multi-tenant system. They decided that their entire internal implementation was wrong. They'd done the wrong database model and a few other bits. But the API was sound. They deleted the entire implementation, rewrote it, and all the tests passed. And they were like, can we just ship it? I think so. <laughs> the tests are passing. What else do we need? which is this idea, and this is something that will come from the people who uh, have been doing this at the class level. When you've been refactoring your classes, you've had to refactor your tests, which means you don't have confidence because your tests have changed. So do you know it still works? Um, it took them two days to realize that, yes, actually, you should deploy it. <laughs> but what can't we test this way? So the things that we can't test is when a backend changes based on the same request, things like caching. Because from a customer perspective, it looks the same. We can't test for things like internal state changes, like audit. Performance is another one. We can't test performance this way. You can to an extent. We can't test things like cloud services because performance or the response times of our tests are important. The tests that we run here, we have one service that has 8,000 tests. It's probably more than that now, actually. Um, but that responds in nine seconds and runs all the tests in nine seconds using this methodology. If that was using cloud services like ServiceBoss and Cosmos, things like that, it wouldn't respond that quickly. 
But what you can do is use all of these tests and just switch out your implementation and deploy it to live, and then test it there. And the other thing we can't do is we can't test configuration. We can't test your deployment configuration to make sure you've put the right connection strings in. Or can we? And that's where observability comes in. So what is observability? I don't know whether we've had many talks on observability here today or this week. Um, this is a quote from Charity Majors, who's Honeycomb's um, CTO and co-founder. Um, and it's about as close to a definition as we can have. Observability isn't new, it's from control theory, um, but Charity coined it in the, the context of software about seven years ago now. Um, but what's important about this is this particular statement is the observability is about being able to understand the inner system state just by asking questions from the outside. We just talked about outside in testing, testing everything from the outside. That's what got me thinking. So let's talk a little bit about ODD. ODD does sound a bit odd. Um, I hate the term, I hate having another DD. We don't need any more DDs. Um, but observability-driven development, you can call it tracing during development. We're going to call it tracing during development, but apparently TDD was taken as well. So, um, But observability is an output from our application. When we go to production, we can't run without it. So why aren't we testing it? Why isn't it part of what we're testing holistically in our applications? Observability can do things like detecting parallelization. We can detect whether methods start at the same time or actions start at the same time. It can detect things like code paths. Did I hit this particular thing or that particular thing? But what's most important here is that what you care about on your local debugging journey, when you're locally debugging tests, when you're locally debugging your application, is highly likely to be important when you go to production. So if that's important, why aren't we testing it? So let's have a look at another little bit of code. This is caching code for potential future employees out there. I wouldn't write caching code like this. This is just an example. Um, but the idea is we're going to go and get some stuff um, from an API, and we're going to drop it into a, a memory cache. And if it's not there, we'll go and get it from the database. So how would we write a test for that? Because from a customer's perspective, they get the data. OK, well, this is where something called open telemetry comes in. So open telemetry is the number two project from the Cloud Native Compute Foundation behind some small thing they call Kubernetes, I think, something like that. Um, it's the de facto standard for outputting telemetry in your applications now. Um, Java has some really good implementations around agents. Um, .NET has, um, in my opinion, the best implementation, but I might be slightly biased. Um, but what this allows us to do, and the, the, the specific thing that's really interesting here, um, if this actually, does this actually work? Hey, there we go. Is this in-memory exporter. So what that's going to do is all of our span data is going to go into an in-memory array. That's cool. Because we're doing everything in mem we're doing everything in memory, so we can use that to test. So we can do that. We can add it to our um, host builder, and we can wrap our database call in a span. So now we've got a span that's around our database call, and in our test, we can ensure that we hit the database. Now I would never write this test. Because what we're doing there is testing implementation. We're making sure that something hit the database. That's not important to that test. But the second one is. Because the second one is making sure that we didn't hit the database. Because that is important. And what we're doing there is we're going to do our same hitting the API. And we're going to remove all the spans from memory. We're going to do it again. And then make sure there wasn't one that hit the database. And then you can do things like refactoring for readability, write yourself some extension methods, make it make sense. So we hit our API and we do 
collected spans dot has span with name has span with characteristics which makes things a little bit more interesting when we're writing tests because we can test some of those internal implementations if they're important for us to see in production and it's that that last part I guarantee a lot of people will walk away from here and not understand they'll go away oh I can test the internal implementation I'll write everything with this thing don't do that because then your tests become brittle you can't change your telemetry that's a problem and I said something about parallel processing we can do the same with parallel processing. We can go and get all of the spans for a particular trace. And we can make sure they've got the same parent IDs. Because we've got that span data and we're testing the characteristics here. We're not testing the names particularly, but we are testing that all the get from DBs all have the same parent ID. So, a couple of do's and don'ts. Do you use it for things you care about in production? Test things that are important. And I want to underline that one. Write in tests that are important. If they don't feel like they're adding value, do not write them. Because every test that you write is technical debt. So write the tests that are important. That are going to tell you something. Make sure that when you're writing observability data into these things, it has good data on it. It has good context. Don't check the DB was called. And more specifically, don't go and check that your method with those 4,000 tests that was called. Nobody cares about your test and your, your, your class, okay? Just. Now, the other thing that we can do with this is we can actually use tracing as a test artifact. So because our tests have tracing in there, because we're using open telemetry in our tests, and the really cool thing is, especially in .NET, you can actually add tracing only to your tests. You don't have to add it to your main application. Because activity exists in .NET, you don't even have to add open telemetry to your main project. You can just add it into the tests, which is the example I'll give at the end. So we can actually write a trace for every single test that we run. So every test runs has a, a trace that's attached to it. Because this little line here, this line here, what that's actually doing is it's passing in a trace ID. So .NET is going to pick that up. It's going to say, oh, I'm part of this trace. So all the spans I create are part of that trace. Which means you end up with something like that. So every test will have those. The reason why this is really, really interesting is because now what you've got in your observability platform is what a trace should look like for that particular action. So when you go into your production system and go, this doesn't look right, you've got something to compare it to. And say, well, it should look like this. Why doesn't it look like this? And you get that for free. That's not an additional thing that you need to do. You just need to add the config to OpenTelemetry to send it to your provider. You can do that in CICD, you can do it locally as well. But you can also do things like work out what the, um, the average duration of tests are. What your test runs look like. Which tests were part of which test runs. Which means that you're starting to use the same tools during your dev life cycle that you use in production. Which is a really massive superpower because if you're using the same tools all day in both scenarios you will become much better at finding production issues so a couple of things uh, to take away and um, they're all on the github repo as well um, there's the repository for this um, which is a dotnet repository um, i would also say have a go and look at um, tdd revisited by ian cooper um, which he did during pandemic, so not a lot of people saw it, um, which is a deconstruction of what TDD is. Go and have a look at writing tests that don't suck um, by David Whitney, which is a very David Whitney title, um, which is all about JavaScript and writing these kind of readable tests and writing refactoring um, tests in JavaScript. 
Um, I'm obliged to mention because um, my employer paid me to be here. Um, Honeycomb has a free forever account, um, so you can do the stuff that we've just talked about there and add Honeycomb to your um, platform for free um, without a credit card or anything. And we also wrote the book on observability engineering, which is free download, um, which is an O'Reilly book um, that you can go and download. But that's me. Um, I would just like to say I, this is my passion project. Um, it sounds like it can't work. It does. It really does. And you can write tests and write applications a lot faster if you start embracing it. So please go away and try it. Um, and if anything comes up, do catch me on Twitter. Catch me anywhere that you want. I'll be outside for the rest of the day. Um, come and grab me. We have tons of Snickers. Um, and you're welcome to take them away because it means I don't have to take them on the plane. So thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. So do we have any questions for Martin before we go off to a coffee break? I think they'll... Stand up. So the, uh, the question was um, elaborating a little bit on the contract testing aspects. So contract testing, if you look at this as a, um, the, con the reason contract testing exists is to make sure that your API is, um, it doesn't break for your consumers. That's one of the big reasons why contract testing exists. Now, if we take this approach, you will know that your API is broken for your consumers inside of your test framework which means you don't need to do something externally. Now, the way that that works is if you have separate classes the um, to-do API that we talked about there, the add API, add to-do um, to request object, if that's defined inside of your test framework and not inside your application, so you've got two different ones, if I have to change my to-do request object in order to make my test pass, all of my consumers need to do the same thing. So you're getting that notification that you would get from the consumer testing, the consumer contract testing. You're getting that notification at build time when you run your tests, which is far superior in my opinion. Yes, there are other reasons to do contract testing, but I think most of them go out of the window when you make sure that you never break your API. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Any more questions? I'm more of a tomato man. Um, the question was, what's bad about Cucumber? Um, Cucumber's promise was the idea of, I can pass all of this on to my business owners, and my business owners can then write tests. I can count on no hands the amount of time where that's actually happened, and all that's happened is I've been forced into writing step definitions myself for my code. I'd prefer to just do this because I have more freedom. If you can find, and there are situations where you can actually pass your Cucumber tests onto the business and you write your step definitions and they just have a whole load of step definitions and they just build all of those tests. If you can do that, go and do it. And tell me about it because I've never found anybody who does. It's always the developers and the engineers that end up writing those tests. And if you're writing those tests, why would you constrain yourself to step definitions when you've got the entirety of your coding language at your disposal and you can write it like that. It's not that it's bad, it's just the usefulness is outweighed by this. More questions? I will be around as well. I think they're all waiting for stickers. <laughs> okay, so one more question, one last question before we go for the coffee break. No, I think they'll grab you outside. It's fine. They're shy. It's fine. <laughs> okay, thank you, everybody, and we'll see you back here right after coffee for our next slot.